This should be a really fun class, is all I can say. And it says classes without quizzes, but we may do a little quiz or two for the audience just to keep you guys sharp. Um, but first, I want to introduce uh, uh, my uh, three uh, fellow panelists, uh, the three additional panelists, because um, they are I each in their own right pretty remarkable folks. And I think we're going to have a great discussion. So this is my friend Sal Khan. Um, and Sal, you guys all probably know Sal because of his extraordinary work in the hedge fund industry. <laughs> because when I met him, he was working as an analyst at a hedge fund. You remember that, Sal? That's hilarious. And my younger brother, Tom, was in the hedge fund world. And he's like, more slightly more successful. But anyway, and then, and when I first met Sal, he, was, he had started Khan Academy in his, where, he'll tell you where he started. And it had just rocketed to success. And I remember having conversations. You had that little office in Mountain View, upstairs in that place in Mountain View. And we were talking about whether or not Khan Academy should be a for-profit or a not-for-profit, because it had become so successful so quickly. And as you all know, it's become this extraordinarily important educational institution in the country. I'm sure many of your kids and grandkids have used, have seen Sal teach them, you know, whatever Sal teaches them and among. But it, he, it's what I think is most interesting about Sal, other than the fact, I will tell you a tiny bit of his background. He grew up outside of uh, New Orleans. His parents are immigrants from Bangladesh and India. Um, he was the high school cartoonist, newspaper cartoonist at his high school. Um, he graduated from MIT and got an MIT, uh, a MBA from a school somewhere in, near Boston. Um, <laughs> and, he has, and he has little kids and uh, who uh, he and his lovely bride are very good parents too. And he's really one of the most important figures in American education now, which is pretty good for a hedge fund analyst. Okay, so next, next to Sal is Nick Kristoff. So I'm sure many of you are used to reading uh, Nick and his lovely wife Cheryl Wu Dunn's columns and books. Um, so I, always, I first met Nick when he was a op-ed columnist for the New York Times. As you may know, you, li he lived in Indi you lived in China. He's done all sorts of international reporting uh, in, earlier in his career. Um, he's, had, he's won a couple of Pulitzers. He and his wife have written best-selling books. The two that I think are most relevant to what we're going to talk about today are the book that they published in 2020, Tightrope, which is about Nick's experience growing up in the town of Yamhill, Oregon, because he is from a, a small town in Oregon where he and Cheryl now live. Um, and uh, it's the story of the, the challenges of working class America today. Uh, the book, pro well, one of the books that they wrote together prior to that is a really terrific book called A Path of Peers, which is about early, the investment in early, the importance of investing in early childhood. And it's sort of a roadmap for how we as a society should be investing in kids and young people. Um, and we're going to talk about that a lot today. Um, and as you may know, Nick recently stepped down from his post as a columnist at um, the Times to announce that he was going to run for the governor of Oregon, as governor of Oregon. So hopefully Phil Knight will pay attention to that, by the way. Um, and uh, and he, he will not root for the Oregon Ducks against Stanford. He's already <laughs> promised me that. Um, and Nick is from this small town in Oregon. He also went to a school near Boston. Um, and uh, is just one of the really remarkable thinkers and, and leaders in this country. And we're going to talk. He has also been a really close colleague of mine uh, talking about kids and education issues for many years. He's really one of the most thoughtful people on those topics. And we're going to be talking a lot about that today. So welcome, Nick. OK. I le we're leaving out things like Rhodes Scholar and all the other things you could. You can read his full bio later, just like you can for our next guest, Julian Castro. So Julian, he had the wisdom to go to Stanford, is what I would really like to say, with his brother Joaquin, who is also here this weekend. Um, and they have a remarkable story. They were raised in San Antonio, Texas. Their mom they were, uh, is a political activist. And um, 
they, I think you're, uh, Julian can tell us, but I, it started taking Julian and Joaquin to rallies and other political events when they were kids in San Antonio. And, uh, you know, the story from there is just quite remarkable. Um, he, went, he came out to Stanford. I think our good friend Jim Montoya had the wisdom to admit Julian and Joaquin. They came to Stanford, uh, did really well here. They both then went back to San Antonio, where uh, shortly after, I, I think at age 26 or something, Julian got elected to the, to the city council in San Antonio. Then he became the mayor of San Antonio, Texas. Um, he was a, also an incredible leader on kids and education issues. Um, that's when I first really got to know him professionally because they were doing really important stuff around early childhood education in the city of San Antonio. Uh, he, um, he and his wife Erica have two kids, two, two kids. Erica's here too, today too. Um, and after being mayor for a couple of terms, Secretary, uh, President Obama uh, asked Julian to be the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. So he was then the HUD Secretary. Um, very effectively, we worked on a bunch of stuff there like wiring housing projects around the United States uh, for broadband. Um, and then uh, Julian now is back in San Antonio doing a variety of different stuff. And as you may know, he ran for president in 2020 along with some other people that we know well. Um, and uh, he is also one of the extraordinary leaders around kids and education in this country. And that's what I really hope that the conversation will focus on today. The three topics that we want to cover in general are, and, and I know it's, we framed it uh, which side of history, the impact of how technology is reshaping democracy in our lives. So we are going to talk about the state of our democracy today. And I have a question for you at the beginning, for you all at the beginning before we get into the question. But we're also going to really talk a lot about kids and education. And where, does, what is, where is this country going? Um, and uh, we have three of the wisest and most thoughtful people that I know to discuss that topic. So we'll launch in. But I did say there was going to be a quiz. So here is the quiz for all of you. You can please put up your hand. How many of you are worried about the state of American democracy today? <laughs> and the second question is, how many of you think that we have underinvested in America's children and education system for the last 50 years? And the reason I say that is I think that's what we ought to talk about. So let me start by asking the group a thing, a, 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 an opening question uh, that relates to the pandemic. Because we're all educators. And the pandemic had this incredible impact on kids in education. Um, I, our, we have four children, one of whom is still in high school. And he spent much of last year studying, it, studying and going to school in bed in his room. He did. And, um, and, and so we've all been through this really traumatic 20-month period. And it's obviously impacted every single person in this room, continues to impact our lives. But I think that the impact on kids in education has been extraordinary, both from a negative standpoint, but also from an opportunity standpoint about how we could remake education in this country. So I'll start with you, Sal, and then Nick, Julian, you guys go. How, talk a little about what the pandemic did to kids and families in this country, and also specifically how it ch impacted education and how it will impact education going before. Sal. Sure. Yeah, th thanks for that, Jim. Um, so we, we first caught wind of what was happening uh, February of 2020. I remember we got a, a letter from a teacher in South Korea saying, hey, I'm using Khan Academy to keep my kids learning during the, they had nationwide school closures in February of 2020. And I remember us thinking, that's wild, that a whole nation would shut down its schools physically because of a, of a pandemic. Right. And then many of you all know, this was the first area, Santa Clara County was, was one of the first areas to have community spread. And that's where it came on our radar, wow, this, might not be so wild, it might happen here. And we started to realize it was one of the moments where you look left and you look right and you're like, I think this might be us because people are gonna need something that can work in a classroom environment, can work in a home environment. And so we started stress testing our servers and figuring out what we can do. And we saw that, that March uh, when the whole nation and really the rest of the world, 1.4 billion kids uh, were out of school physically. From our vantage point, we saw our traffic go from 30 million learning minutes per day to about 90 million learning minutes per day. 
because there's just a whole bunch of people just didn't know what to do. Uh, they just needed something to keep kids learning. And what we saw in that phase is we started, a lot of people have talked about the K-shaped recovery in the economy. You saw that in stark contrast in the school system as well, where smaller school districts, which tended to be more affluent school districts that tended to uh, be able to rely on people having internet access at home, they were able to flip the switch within a week and the kids kept learning. And large urban school districts uh, where they couldn't assume the kids had internet access, uh, where they had all these other services that they were doing for families, they had to take more time to coordinate, to get devices out, and it was just more political too. And so even that first phase, you had two or three months for them to get started. And you already saw the differences, that, the divergence that started to happen. And frankly, it just continued uh, through, through much of last year. As much as we could tell, it's interesting, when you're an online platform, you can tell in real time how much people are learning. You can literally count to the second. As far as we could tell, if we could measure learning time in the system as a whole, it was down dramatically. If you could take a stopwatch into every classroom or every Zoom in America, because it was all online last year, the actual amount of learning time was probably down 30 or 40%. And it would disproportionately hit kids who didn't have sufficient access at home, a large urban school districts, and now we're seeing it in the test scores. Uh, the test scores are, on average, and math is worse, it's about 10 to 15% down from what you would typically see. Yep. And what makes that even more stark is that the kids in, in more affluent areas, all of our kids, actually, they've had tr trouble too, social, emotionally, being isolated, but they're doing just fine on the test scores. They actually kept learning. So that 15% is the average, so that means the other half of kids got way worse than 15%. And it's even starker than that, because in a lot of these school districts, they don't even know where 10% of the kids are. So those kids didn't even show up to take the test. So if they showed up to take the test, we suspect that it would be, it would be that much worse. So, the picture isn't good. Uh, now, the silver lining, I'd say, is that you know, a lot of what we've been talking about for many years, and it's not our ideas, is the reason why so many people struggle, especially in, in STEM subjects and subjects like math, is it's cumulative. And even before the pandemic, we saw 70% of kids, when they go to community college, they don't even place into college algebra, which is essentially 10th grade math. They place into remedial math, which is usually 6th or 7th grade math. So we have a system, even before the pandemic, year after year, everyone goes through the motions, but their gaps accumulate. They get to college, and there's like, no, you have to go back to middle school. That's just gotten that much worse now. And we've always said the solution here is let every student have the opportunity and incentive to fill in any gaps that they have and learn at their own pace. And obviously you couldn't do that without some help from technology. The good thing is that's now a mainstream idea. Every school district we talk to is saying, yes, we have to address this, we have to do high dosage tutoring, we have to do personalized learning, we have to do whatever to, to get kids uh, caught up. And you know, there's two other data points. We, we started a new tutoring platform because of the pandemic. It's called schoolhouse.world. It's also a not-for-profit, it's all free. Uh, we're leveraging volunteership, so any of y'all could actually volunteer to be a tutor. We have a whole vetting process. But you can tutor kids not only all over the country, all over the world for free, and it's it's a pretty fun experience. It's a pretty shaky group. I'm not sure. It's I'd a shaky. Want to I think I think I think they'll be able to get through the vetting. Uh, but but I'll, I'll say one last thing. E even though it looks like we're coming back after this 20-month period, every educator, and it might not just be educator, it might be everyone, yeah. but educators especially, there's a strange, not strange actually, I understand it, there's a deep fatigue in the system right now. Uh, there's been so much change that's been happening and people going left and right and uncertainty about in school, out of school, masks, no masks, you know, all of the stuff. Uh, any, any person you talk to in education, and, and just one data point, we've been exploring after school programs, and we're trying to find teachers for it. So there's all this federal funding that's coming to do after school programs, to do tutoring, to do this. Can't find anyone to do it. You go to the teachers, say $50 an hour, no one's showing up, $60 an hour. In previous years, people would have showed up for that. $70 an hour, they're just saying, we're tired. We can't do it. So it's an interesting phenomenon where right now the resourcing is actually there. It's the human capital is a little bit harder and the oh, ideas. Amazing. By the way, just so you know, and I think a Stanford audience needs to know this, there's 17 million, you all know the term digital divide actually created by a Stanford Law School graduate named Larry Irving. 17 million kids in the United States did not have adequate broadband or devices during the pandemic. That was not the Steyer children, it was probably not your children, but 17 million kids in the United States were still part of the digital divide. And what Sal just said is correct. There is going to be dollars for broadband. We've got seven or eight billion dollars in the American Rescue Plan for this. There's more money in the reconciliation package, which hopefully is gonna pass in the next couple of weeks. But 
we are at an extraordinary moment in the country. So Nick Julian, Sal laid it out pretty big. What do you think? So some of those 17 million kids who didn't have broadband are my neighbors in Yamhill, Oregon. And some of those not only didn't have any broadband access in this rural area, but also didn't have any cell service reaching their place in the hills. Those kids are at home. There is no in-person schooling. What are they supposed to do? How are they supposed to learn? And I do think that my tribe, uh, liberals, made a, uh, a, a deep mistake when, uh, it, when we, as a group, became uh, so hostile to in-person learning. Usually, a pretty good heuristic uh, was that if President Trump said something, it was wrong. When he supported uh, in-school learning, that was actually a case where he was right. And I think we instinctively, <laughs> because, he said, because he said that, we took the opposite course. In fact, looking back, um, you know, in-person schooling was necessary for so many disadvantaged kids who didn't have access to broadband, who didn't have parents who could support them, who didn't have books at home. And I saw that in my community. Um, two, you know, two, two, two stories about families I care a lot about. Uh, one family, a uh, guy who'd been, um, uh, he'd been off drugs for four years, uh, he, his wife as well, um, they had a baby shortly before the pandemic, and this was the first child born in three generations in that family who was not born with drugs or alcohol in the system. We were so full of hope. This family had broken that cycle. Then early in that pandemic, um, he and his wife relapsed because he was no longer having to submit urine tests uh, for accountability, no longer had in-person support uh, for support. When they were uh, high, then the baby found their meth stash and ingested some and had to be hospitalized. Uh, they became homeless. Uh, they have actually now, <laughs> uh, they have recently uh, recovered. They're, they're getting support again. But that child, that infant, went through some really, really tough uh, times. And um, another family in um, the next town over, McMinnville, Oregon, uh, the mom was out of the picture. She, she had substance abuse problems. The dad was a single dad who was really trying to, to support his two daughters. And, but he lost his job at a restaurant early in the pandemic. Um, his uh, kids were home because there was no in-person schooling. Small home. They were getting on each other's nerves. In early this year, he was on the phone for an hour with the employment office trying to get through. He could never actually get through to a person. After an hour, he gave up. He slammed the phone down. He's irritated. Uh, he's not always a good manager of his emotions. He, the girls were nagging him about being hungry, so he went to the kitchen to uh, make some food for them. And one of them started talking about uh, how mom would have had food ready for them, and he completely lost it. And he began choking, one, strangling one of his daughters. Uh, the other girl jumped at him to rescue her sister. He then uh, hit them, and he also he cursed them and said the, the worst things about them. Uh, they ran out, neighbor called 911. He was arrested. Uh, they are now in foster care. That family has been, I mean, destroyed is too wrong a word, but they are going through uh, this horrible situation. And those girls, I don't know to what extent they can recover from what, the, I mean, their dad strangled them. Uh, they are in foster care, which, as you know, has terrible outcomes. And there were a lot of contributors to that, including, you know, their dad's emotional lack of, lack of ability to handle that. But if he had been able to get through to the employment office, if the girls had been able to be in person schooling, there was less of a risk of that kind of thing. And I think incidents like that happened to so many of the people that I knew 
where all kinds of risks that kids face were magnified during the pandemic. And we as a society didn't do enough to support those families, to mitigate those risks, to provide outlets for families who desperately needed that education to continue. That McKinsey estimates a million additional kids will drop out of school because of uh, the pandemic impact on education. A million extra dropouts. The toll of that is gonna be felt for decades and decades and decades to come because in the pandemic, we blew it and didn't adequately support Americans kids, America's kids. Julian? Yeah, I mean, it, this hits home for me, just like I'm sure it does uh, a lot of folks in the room, whether it's a parent, a grandparent. Uh, my wife, Erica, is here. We have a 12-year-old daughter and a six-year-old son. Uh, and so we watched, like a lot of other parents, and participated in fully this total transition into virtual learning. Um, coming out of it, I mean, my impression was that they didn't get nearly as much out of it as we would have hoped. And also that the systems, the operationalization of virtual learning was so rudimentary. Um, they asked so much from the educators who were not used to that environment. The tools, like I still don't know how to log in properly to Seesaw, which is one of the apps that they use, <laughs> you know, like the, the apps themselves are rudimentary and then connecting folks, uh, much less I think folks that of course, that don't have access to broadband, aren't familiar with these apps. Um, so it asks a lot of everybody, from parents to educators uh, to the kids themselves. Um, and I, I think that going forward, that that's one of the, the, the things that um, we have to learn from and work with, because I, ha I sense, and you know, Sal is a perfect example of this, virtual learning is, is here to stay. That's not gonna change, it's only gonna expand and including in the public school setting and in other settings that it didn't used to take hold in. Um, and I, I feel as though there's a lot of work that has to be done in these school districts to implement a better system so that you can effectively educate in that platform through virtual learning. Because right now, I mean, teachers and, and my wife, Erica, uh, is now in charge of the virtual learning for the elementary schools in her public school district she was conscripted to do that. She was usually curriculum coach, the lead curriculum coach in her district, but because there's a teacher shortage, they made all of the curriculum coaches, uh, this is a Title I funded school district, the curriculum coaches uh, do virtual learning, become teachers again, basically classroom teachers, right? because they have a shortage of teachers in that district this year. And so all of a sudden she finds herself supervising the virtual learning element for elementary schools in that district. Uh, and that's just one example of how scrambled things have gotten. If this is here to stay, I think that both in terms of resources and policy and understanding, we need to make a lot of advancement or else what you're gonna get is just kids that are not learning at the clip that they should, right? You know, whatever percent they get out of it that we saw with our kids. So when you all think about this, by the way, we're, we haven't even talked about really the social and emotional impact on kids. On, on all of us, but on young people. As a, as a father of four, the biggest thing that I saw was this, the social and emotional impact of the pandemic. And also, you know, running the biggest kids media group in the country, we have all these lessons about screen time and there's certain limits. Here's the common sense formula for screen time. All of that went out the window, right? Because your kids are in, that's how they are, A, and, and we loosened up, I don't know if you guys did this with your kids, on how much time, particularly our youngest son, Jesse, could spend with friends, we let him because he was going crazy. Because the teenagers, my gosh, their whole existence is about interacting with their friends. But they were spending so much time in front of screens. Platforms like Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube became incredibly important. And they lived, that's why I said, I literally used to watch my son in his bedroom. But, but huge impact. So comment on that, and then I wanna talk about some of the stuff we ought to do about this. Yeah. I was just gonna say that, I mean, kids are just incredibly clever in the best of times about evading uh, restrictions. And when they're empowered during a pandemic, uh, boy, they get even better. In China, early in the pandemic, um, schools around the country were using a particular software to provide kids with homework and lessons. And then kids all across China uh, realized that uh, that software got dropped from the platform if it had a really bad rating. And so all of a sudden, hundreds of millions of kids began giving it the worst rating, and it briefly dropped off the platform, and homework could no longer be assigned in China. 
Never underestimate America's kids. <laughs> By the way, how about, the kids. how about China just set a rule about how much time you can play video games, right? Yeah. Which is really interesting because this is that we're going to get we're going to get confronted with this, right? So here in the we have the common sense standards about how much screen time. China, they just said from up up on high, no, actually, whatever it is, half an hour a week, that's it. And we're going to and they actually have the ability to look how much time you're spending. So let me ask a question. You guys are have you looked at all at this other than as a parent? at the social emotional side of this, is there anything you're doing that I'd say the same thing, Lilian? And then I want to talk about, okay, how do we invest, how do we change some of this if we look out over the next few years? But have you looked at that at all? I, I think people are gonna look a lot more at it now. Everyone knows that the social emotional is important, but the problem is it's very it, traditionally hard to measure. And so when all we're measuring is the math, the reading comprehension, and the writing, well, that, that's what everyone indexes on. Even science is oftentimes ignored, especially at the elementary and sometimes middle school level, because it's not measured as much. I think now it's becoming so glaring, especially because of the pandemic. What we're seeing is the first, we're seeing actually online usage is down system-wide right now, mm -hmm. because, the, because schools are spending so much time getting kids back into the, the social emotional groove of things. Uh, there's a school I started not too far from here, it's our lab school, and we are, we are spending two, three months, and we've always had a focus on social emotional learning, but that's all we're doing for the last, especially the last month and a half. Uh, so, and, and we've been talking to some of our assessment partners that you know, traditionally assess all of you know, your test scores on math and reading. They're coming up with measures for, for social emotional it could be survey based. It'll, it's an interesting problem to brainstorm how you can actually do a reasonable standardized test about where people are in this dimension. But people are taking it really seriously because just anecdotally, just observationally, something is clearly going on. I know, you know, we'll probably eventually talk about the depression and the anxiety yep. and the that epidemics that you're seeing at the university level at the and I don't think it is just Facebook. I think there's many things that are uh, playing into it, but we need to figure out a way to measure it uh, to understand how we can make it better. Mm -hmm. Julian, any, I, I mean, you see it in your own kids? Oh, for sure. I mean, especially our 12-year-old daughter. Right? Yeah, she's it's, engrossed completely in that world. If she's not, I mean, a couple months back, I walked into a room, and she has her laptop in front of her, is listening to something off her iPhone, <laughs> and then also has an iPad near there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he has, you know, Netflix on and whatever's on the laptop and uh, something else. I mean, what these kids do to multitask, you know, and, but how engrossed they are in all of it. You think about when television emerged, you know, a couple of generations ago, there were a lot of the same concerns that people had, right, about what this would mean and attention span and all of that. But as much attention as people fixed on the TV, I think it's, it's amped up 10 times in terms of how attached they are to their phone and everything else. And, and that the research on this, there's some, but I think it's still developing. And how do you put that, you know, uh, how do you put that to best use in schools? I know for us as parents, I mean, and really Erica has led the way on this, is putting limits on yeah. screen time, like a lot of parents and just trying to do what we can. So I will tell you something interesting from the standpoint of common sense politically, because I want to talk now about, about some of the solutions and also a little about democracy before we go to questions from you guys. I mean, one of the things very interesting is, so we have take, at Common Sense, our, we take on the big tech companies, uh, sometimes en masse, usually one by one. Um, and we have really hammered them over the past five or six years around the fact that this is an arms race. The reason I say this is that Stanford audience says half of the people went to Stanford, right? Half of the people who built these products went to Stanford. A bunch of them have been in my classes, and sometimes I have arguments with them about this, by the way, is did you not listen at all in civil rights and civil liberty <laughs> about, no, because it's amazing. I have had that conversation with some of the most significant executives. If you literally go down the companies one by one, you will see that Stanford is the dominant, sorry for you Harvard people, but is the, the dominant university in all of this. But there's an arms race for attention. I mean, attention and data are the holy grail. They're the new oil. And so part of what has happened is that we have built products. I mean, you look at the guys who started um, Instagram, 
right? Both of who left, by the way, because they were really not happy with the way Mark was running the company. If you haven't figured that out, why those guys left. And you start to see people who started peeling away from some of the companies now when they understand the implications of what some of those companies have done. But basically, they are so sophisticated. The kids are really sophisticated, but the kids who graduate from here are pretty sophisticated. And they build all these different designs. They're, they're design techniques to keep you addicted. They're basically designed to keep you on the platform because that's how you monetize it. Particularly the ad-based models are completely based on how much time you can get somebody to stay on the platform. So when Julian is talking about his 12-year-old, that is intentionally built by engineers at places like Instagram or YouTube or Snapchat. And so you have to think, one of the things, and I, we always used to talk about this at Stanford is for years, Stanford was turning out all the engineers and computer scientists building these companies, and there was no class about the, the ethical and sociological implications of what you were doing. It was just, how can I get a job at Google or Facebook or wherever? And so, and then finally now in the last couple of years, I'm quite critical of this, or, uh, this university that I love and went to and have been a professor at for years, about why we didn't ask our students to think about the ethical implications of what the products they were building. And why, it's a very, and I think, by the way, I think alumni have got to ask this question and that, the, and that from MTL on down, we have to ask that question. Because the platforms now are so powerful and pervasive in all of our lives, but particularly in young people's lives. And so a question I want to ask you all is, because there is a legislative agenda. You know, Washington has been out to lunch on this for, 15 years, nothing is passed in Washington. No privacy laws, no, uh, so, uh, no platform accountability laws, no, uh, no reining in of sort of guardrails around the major tech platforms. But I think you're about to see that change, hopefully on a bipartisan basis. So, and, and we have a fairly significant legislative, the reason, by the way, just one example of that is, we passed the, Calif we wrote and passed the privacy law in California that all of you benefit from, the CCPA, in 2018. Why? Because we could not get it done in Washington, D.C. Even though Ed Markey and Dick Blumenthal and other people would introduce privacy legislation, and Europe was doing GDPR at the time, the first privacy law. We haven't passed a privacy law in the United States since Mark Zuckerberg was in diapers. And uh, that's true, though. And so, and, and by the way, we had a period where the tech industry told us that privacy was an old passe norm, and it didn't matter anymore. So my question to you guys is, when you look at issues like, particularly in the context of kids in education, what, if you, giving you the magic wand, what do you want to see happen in the next two or three years? And what do you think it'll take us to get there? You know, I'll, I'll start, and this is not a popular thing to do, I'll start slightly defending Facebook and Instagram. Sure. And then, and then I'll, I'll double down on everything you said. <laughs> 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 you know, this, this isn't a new problem. Uh, me, this is, this is, you know, right now we're saying, oh, the machine learning algorithms have figured out that if you work people up, they're more likely to keep watching. Well, people have figured this out in the news 50, 60, 70 years ago. The difference is, if you go 70 years ago, there were three networks, and everyone was watching those three networks. Uh, but they also knew, I mean, you know, the news has all, will always make you slightly depressed. They're gonna, you know, a world of, at the time, three billion people, now seven or eight billion people, they're gonna take the five worst things that happened on that planet and then feed it to you and get you agitated about it so that, so that you watch ads. And this has been going on for 70 years. Then if you go into the cable period, now all of a sudden it wasn't just three networks. You could get a little bit more specialization and you saw as you got more of that specialization, people got better at triggering. I could now trigger people on the right, I could now trigger people on the left. The guardrails started to get, get a little bit wider yeah. and so they got better at doing that and it, was, and it was good business. The social media environment, they're going, Two things happened. Now they can super micro-target and they're using machine learning algorithms. They're just doing the things that the media companies would have dreamed about doing 50, 50 or 60 years ago. So I don't think they're somehow more evil. It's really the same human instincts that are doing it. But the, the one really new thing that's happening here is, is that they have kind of a plausible deniability. Like that's not my content. I just put it out there for people to connect and someone put it up there and the algorithm thought that this person would enjoy it and they're doing it. And then that's what really causes the because we know now people with very little accountability, oftentimes very fringe folks on, in any dimension of, of the political spectrum or any, any spectrum, Correct. are now able to get an audience. 
they know how to trigger people. Everyone's figured this out. The better you get at triggering people, the more audience you're going to get. And then you're left with uh, people getting triggered in some way. And it could be triggered politically. It could be triggered feeling bad about yourself, wanting to buy certain clothes, changing your body image. And that's messing with everyone's brains. I, I, I think China, I mean, I, I, and I, I normally don't say this type of thing, but <laughs> we, regulate, we regulate drugs, we regulate alcohol, we regulate firearms. I think this is as significant, especially for younger people. They don't have a developed frontal lobe. Uh, I mean, and we could argue whether at some point do we, you know, do any, any of us can really control ourselves that much. But I think especially for younger people where there's already an example where you can't drink until you're 21, you can't, et cetera, et cetera, some type of reasonable uh, guidelines around best practices, how much can you use, et cetera, et cetera. I, think, I, I don't think that should, be, that should be off the table. It is a complicated issue. I, was, I had a friend who's a, actually a machine, an AI specialist at Facebook. He's actually a Stanford professor who's doing a sabbatical at Facebook. Yeah. Uh, and I was giving him a hard time about this, about how he might feel about himself. And he, <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, but in, in, yeah. in, his, in his defense, in, in his, and in Facebook's defense, I, I he, agree. he says they are thinking about it. But there are a lot of <laughs> there are a lot of co competing I interests there. But it is not an easy problem because I even told him, I'm like, why don't you just regulate it in this way? And he had some good good rebuttals. But it does feel like y you can't because you have, don't have the perfect solution. You just say, oh well, let's just not have any solution. We'll have our 12 year olds spending 10 hours a day getting fed this highly polarizing thing, and we know what's happening with anxiety and depression and polarization in the country. Nick and Julian, you, you get the magic wand for a year or two. What do um, you do? So I pick up the point that Sal made about uh, regulation and accountability. You know, if you look across in, in any industry, whether it was the lead paint industry or the cigarette industry, uh, the, the pharma uh, industry with opioids, then uh, in the absence of regulation and public accountability in the form of pressure, then companies will periodically just try to monetize everything they can. And one of the lessons to me is that one has to provide both that uh, accountability through public pressure and that regulatory uh, accountability. At Section 230 would be uh, part of the, the wand I would, uh, I would wave. Um, can you explain to them Section 230 in like 30 seconds? So you understand what it is? Yeah, so uh, Section 230 uh, from the Communications Decency Act it basically gives uh, legal immunity and protection to a platform that allows people to post whatever they want on it. So that includes everything from uh, Facebook or Instagram to Pornhub to the New York Times comment section, for example. And the idea was that in its infancy, that's really useful to protect these platforms, these are not infants anymore. And when they engage in egregious uh, behavior, post material that is um, you know, really horrible. I, I, there was a uh, woman uh, who'd had a rape video of herself on Twitter for six years and couldn't get Twitter to remove it. And then I called up uh, Twitter and asked why they wouldn't remove it. And it was gone in, you know, in, in a minute or two. But if there had been legal accountability, I think it would have been removed a lot earlier. Um, but if, if you give me a, mag, a, a, a wand, then I think what I would weigh, what I would want even before uh, dealing with the tech industry in terms of helping America's kids would be just some policy interventions that are now actually at stake in Washington. And, you know, there are a lot of issues around America that are really hard, and we don't exactly know how best to solve them. On kids, we actually have really good evidence about what works. And, um, you know, child allowances in the form of a, a tax credit uh, would probably reduce child poverty by about half. We may be able to get that now in Washington if the, if the Biden uh, social infrastructure plan goes through. Uh, high quality pre-K um, slash child care, another intervention that is this enormous amount of evidence about the impact that it will make and the, return, the returns, economic returns that it will achieve. It's not a, an expense, it's an investment. Uh, and again, that may, we may be able to get that now. Um, and, um, you know, since Cory Booker is in, uh, uh, is in the reunion, I should say, you know, the baby bonds that he has championed um, would be a very effective way to uh, reduce uh, race gaps in America, to get more kids to college, uh, and to um, 
uh, to help reduce some of the profound inequities uh, in America. There's pretty good evidence that when a kid has even a small uh, you know, baby bond, even a small education account in their name, even if it's not really enough to make a difference in college affordability, it makes the family think about the possibility of college and significantly increases college attendance uh, rates. So we know what to do. We have the toolbox. The question is, do we have the political will to open that toolbox and use it? And Julian, if it was you at, instead of your friend Joe Biden in the White House, what would you be doing about it? Well, and I think he's doing a lot of good stuff. I hope that his Build Back Better plan gets yep. uh, passed and then implemented. No, I mean, I think that we're at this very um, special moment of opportunity that unfortunately has we've come into the hard way through losing more than 700,000 people during this pandemic, the economic recession, the racial reckoning after the murder of George Floyd. But I, I hope that one of the things that, that more people are feeling right now um, is that we're all in it together, right? That what happens to the most vulnerable people uh, affects all of us. What happens to somebody else's child affects me and my child. And that that gives us the opportunity to do things like Build Back Better um, and, and, to me, get on a path of treating health care as a human right, housing as a human right, education as a human right, and basic sustenance as a human right, um, working in that direction. Now you think about how much progress Bernie has made over these last few years of, of, and Obama with the Affordable Care Act of getting more Americans to see the wisdom of investing in healthcare, we can do that on other things. Um, when it comes to these platforms, if I had a magic wand, I mean, I think to begin with that we need to empower consumers a lot more with privacy and other things and move from an opt-out system to an opt-in system, right? So you empower yourself instead of them from the beginning um, uh, and create much greater incentives um, for them to put the public interest ahead of profit, which is, you know, they're doing profit right now over and over and over again. And um, three Stanford professors, I think uh, Mehran Sahami, Jeremy Weinstein, and was Rob? Rob Reich. Reich yep. have written that book, System Error, yep. about where big tech rent went wrong. It's a great book. Um, and I think that they hit the nail on the head in a lot of ways. But yeah, if I could wave my magic wand, those are some of the things that we would do. I'm going to ask one question that you guys do, which is this. On the democracy front, right, and the impact of the tech platforms on democracy, any particular quick thoughts about that? You know, I, I gave a, a very simple potential solution, which is time, uh, which you could regulate. I mean, you could say no one can spend. And I actually think that applies both to the 12-year-old who's getting a horrible body image of themselves, but it also could apply to, I mean, my mother, the amount of time she spends watching CNN and gets worked up, it's, it really, I mean, it really isn't good for her mental health. Yep. Like, it's, yep. it's, it's, it's uh, so, so I don't think it's just the 12-year-olds. I, I do think there's some more sophisticated things. I, I don't know if it could be done through legislation, but you know, it, it might not just be how do we mitigate the harm. It actually could be some of these platforms could be part of the solution where I actually think you could, and I talked to my friend about this, he thinks it as well. You could actually look at behavior on a platform like a Snapchat, a, a, an Instagram, and detect much earlier when someone is starting to get depressed, detect much earlier when they're starting to have suicidal ideation, when they're starting to become a, a ex extreme in, in some way, and there might be an opportunity to make some, some inter interesting interventions. One thing that I've always talked about at Khan Academy, the internet's out there, it's kind of the Wild West, we see what's happening. You know, one of my dreams is can we be an institution that can help you know, show that it can up-level people. We're seeing with the schoolhouse where people can tutor each other, that's developing their social emotional, it's developing other skills. So I am overall hopeful that eventually some of these platforms can also uh, not just be negative, uh, they can, and, and there are positive things that they are doing, but they can be even, even more positive, part of the solution. I wouldn't have said this uh, even a couple of years ago. I mean, I, historically, I very strongly believed in a marketplace of ideas and best ideas will win out, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, I really have been shaken by uh, some of the, uh, I don't want to call it reporting, but what passes for reporting on you know, some of the, the networks. And I've come to think that there should be more discipline imposed in terms of advertising and in terms of what uh, cable uh, companies convey on their, on their platforms. And that when a channel 
systematically engages in incitement or, you know, for that matter, on vaccines, uh, spreads messages that are going to lead a lot of people to be to die unnecessarily, then I think that there should be pressure on advertisers to uh, not monetize, uh, to, 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 to not support that, and on cable systems uh, not to, um, uh, you know, to try to impose discipline on, uh, on those networks that uh, carry messages that I think profoundly undermine democracy. One of the, uh, the one comment I will say is freedom of speech does not mean freedom of reach. And so, and I think that's a very important thing because the platforms are really amplifiers and they're not currently held responsible for the amplification through algorithmic processes largely, by the way. And I think that's one of the big discussions that we're gonna have to have as a society over the next few years. Because we're so committed to free speech and that's what half of my classes at Stanford are about. But freedom of speech is not freedom of reach. And when you're amplifying misinformation on an ongoing basis that is undermining public health, undermining democratic norms and institutions that we all took for granted since we went to Stanford, then, then there's something that has to be raised as an issue. Okay, I am gonna wrap up and I just wanna say the following. Number one, thank you all for letting us go 15 minutes over time. Number two, I think reflecting what our three panelists have said, we are at this huge tipping point moment for this country. There's, so, there's a downside to look at, but there are extraordinary opportunities to look at. And the same tech companies that, that we're concerned about some of the downsides are also can drive us to the positive side. So I would end for all of you and just say the following. Which side of history do you think we're, you, our country's going to be on, which side are you going to be on, and what are you going to do about it? Because I think it is now a question whether you go and become a tutor with Sal, or you go help Nick's campaign in Oregon, or you go help Julian and his brother rebuild Texas. <laughs> which side of history do you want to be on? Thank you to these people. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, y'all.